jot it down. The truth of the word is manifest in the person of Jesus. Okay, I'll say it again. The truth of the word is manifest in the person of Jesus. Now, manifest means shown, displayed, revealed. So, the very truth of the Bible, what it stands on, the integrity of it, is displayed in the fulfillment of the biblical prophecies coming to pass in Jesus. Okay, are you with me? And uh, we find that in John 1 and verse 14. John 1, 14 uh, says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of condemnation. No, grace and truth, right? Thank you, Pastor James. If full of grace and truth, not condemnation, not judgment, not conviction. Uh, conviction is okay, but uh, he, he came with grace and truth. And so from Genesis to Revelation, uh, Jesus is revealed to us. We're studying the Old Testament prophecies. We said last week that uh, the Bible is divided into three different uh, segments, prophetic-wise, and that is found on page 29. It's Jesus is coming from Genesis to Malachi. Jesus has come, it's the four Gospels, and Jesus is coming again. That's the Acts to Revelation. So it, it's imperative that you keep this in mind when you study the Bible, when you read the Bible. Uh, that it is broken into segments uh, over many thousands of years. And that way you'll keep it uh, um, clear. Now, if you do not find the living word in the logos or the written word, or if you don't find the written word in the living word, you're in error. Hallelujah. Okay, let me repeat that. If you do not find the living word in the written word, the logos, or if you do not find the written word in the person of the living word, Jesus, then you're in error. Because Jesus is the fulfillment, the perfect manifestation, the completion of, of the Word of God. He is the Word of God. While you're in John there, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1, 1. 1, 2, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Hallelujah. So, In, on page 25 of your book, in the second column where Pearson is writing, he's quoting Pearson there about midways down, he says, The Holy Scripture and the person of the Lord Jesus Christ are so inseparably bound together that whatever impairs the integrity and authority of the one correspondingly affects the other. The written word is the living word enfolded. The living word is the written word unfolded. You might see that on the test. Christ is the cornerstone of all faith. But that cornerstone is laid in scripture as a bedrock. And to disturb the scripture authority unsettles the foundation of the believer's faith and of the church itself. The Bible is Christ portrayed. Christ is the Bible fulfilled. Okay? In Isaiah 28 and 16, praise the Lord. Isaiah 28 and 16 says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, 
Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Now in your homework assignment for last week, which you do not have to turn in this week, but you do next week, you're to write the uh, comparisons of the written word and the living word. Just a hint here, but this could be one. Hallelujah. There is a counterpart to this verse. Okay? A fulfillment, in other words, in Jesus. All right? L let's read it again. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation a stone. This is prophetic. A tried stone. Who are you talking about? Jesus. A precious cornerstone. This is the written word here. A sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Okay? Hallelujah. Well, I read that because he, Pearson says here, Christ is the cornerstone of all faith. And that cornerstone is laid in the written word as a bedrock. Okay? If your Jesus doesn't fit in the pages of the Bible, you've got the wrong Jesus. Hello? Right? Glory to God. These people that get all spiritual weird on me and get out there in left field with this ooky wooky Jesus. Woo! Better get back to the Word of God. Are you with me? Hallelujah. The key here to this is in Pearson's statement that, um, that the Scripture... If the scripture authority unsettles, uh, if you disturb the scripture authority, it unsettles the foundation of the believer's faith. So if you are on the wrong word, you're, you, you're on, if, let's give it, let's bring it home. You think it's in the Bible, but it's not. And so you've governed your life after that thought of it being there. Then you're still unsettling your faith, real faith, Bible faith. You're, you're chipping away there at your, uh, the, the stone, the, the foundation. Hallelujah. All right, now, on page 26, Arlen, if you... I cut the thing off. Sorry, I forgot I was going to do this. Let me, let me turn it on. Uh, I'm going to have her show, out of the Blue Letter Bible, the word logos... Pop, top of page 26, first column, the Greek term logos then. Everybody say logos. logos. Logos then is used of the Lord Jesus Christ and of the scriptures of truth. Logos means the spoken or written word because it makes manifest and reveals to us invisible thoughts. Christ is the living word because he reveals the invisible God. Now, what he's saying here is that logos is the written or spoken word. Well, the word, it's, it's the Bible, it's the, which is uh, written out for us. You got that up there? Okay, so you can see up here that a word uttered by a living voice embodies a conception or idea. What someone has said, the Bible... A word, the sayings of God, the Bible, decree, mandate, or order. Um, so this is readily available on your computer, Blue Letter Bible. I suggest you look it up. This could be on your test. Uh, what is the definition of logos? Would, please put up rhema. There is a difference between logos and rhema. And the difference is rhema is... The spoken word coming by revelation from God. Okay? She's going to get it there in a second. She has to back it up and then put it back in. Uh, but it's a difference. Logos is being the written word, the Bible. But rhema, which rhema is not going to be on your test. But rhema is God speaking to you by revelation. Enlightenment. Hearing God. Uh, but it must... Rhema must be based on logos. Has to be. Okay? Hallelujah. There we go. This is Rhema. 
that which is or has been uttered by the living voice, God. Any sound produced by the voice and having definite, I can't see over there, meaning, speech, discord, what, what one has said. It's talking about God revealing to you uh, his word. Rhema comes from knowledge of logos. Anything, if you think you have a rhema and it's not in the Bible, you've got wrong information. I cannot emphasize that enough. There's too many of people flitting around out there today that's doing all kinds of things, you know, in the name of God that it looks good, smells good, it seems spiritual enough, but it's not in the Bible. Hallelujah. I won't go into detail on why. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Okay? But you'll need to know the definition of of logos. Look in 1 Corinthians. Uh, 1 Corinthians. Uh, by the way, you might want to hang uh, some kind of marker in Isaiah 28. We'll probably be back. Uh, 1 Corinthians. Praise the Lord. In chapter uh, 2. Verse 16. For who have known the mind of the Lord? that he may instruct him. But we have the mind of Christ. Hallelujah. All right, I say that because he says here on this uh, page 26, essentially the Bible is not something we have to interpret, but that which God has given in order to interpret himself and his will to us in and through the life and mission of his Son. The Bible is called the Word of God or the written Word because it interprets and testifies of Christ. The Holy Spirit is the interpreter of both words, for he receives and shows us the things of Christ through the printed word. Okay, so we have the mind of Christ. This is the mind of Christ, the Logos, the written word. And he makes that real to you by rhema. Okay, he speaks to you. He will speak to you. Uh, I hear people say, and I say it from time to time, the Lord showed me. Uh, I'm not as quick to say that anymore as I used to be when I was a, a young guy because um, I have learned that sometimes I thought it was the Lord but it was my emotions or my desires or even my own wisdom my own intelligence mental intelligence maybe not lining up here and so God does indeed speak today he does definitely talk to us today and he can talk verbally to you and that's unusual he can I'm not going to limit God but when the rhema comes, then it's based on the Word of God and in total agreement with the Word of God. And in fact, is the, the illumination of the Word of God in a manner whether you had not seen it that way before uh, to make it more real to you. Now, here, he says that uh, um, we don't have to interpret the, the Word of God, that basically God is interpreting himself to us. Uh, Turn with me, if you would, to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. Lord, help me. Praise the Lord. There's so much to say. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation okay no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation he's not it's not going to be that uh andrew's going to interpret it one way pastor james another way and i'm another way and uh we don't know who's right there is one interpretation hallelujah verse 21 the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Okay? Then, by the way, he goes on to talk about false prophets. All right, so it's very important to know that the Holy Spirit is the interpreter or the teacher. And it is further important to know that um, without the Holy Spirit, you cannot really understand the Bible. Uh, in Acts, the first chapter, 
Look at there if you would, please. Acts chapter 1. And uh, beginning with verse 4. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. Which, saith he, you have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. Now Jesus said, wait in Jerusalem until you receive the promise of the Father, which is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And so when they were come together, they asked him, saying, they still think it in the natural, well, is it time to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know times or seasons, which the Father's put in his own power, but, say but, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, unto the uttermost parts of Bradenton and the world. Hallelujah. All right? So, here, if it's important enough for the Scriptures to say, don't go out until you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we should take heed. But the problem is, the majority of the church, as we know the church today, overlooks this and just goes about doing it in their own power. They have some power from God because they're saved, but not near what they need in order to accomplish this uh, commission. Hallelujah. Now, it, look with me here. He mentions these scriptures, John 16. Look in John 16. Actually, I think we should uh, go to John 14. Uh, I added a few scriptures. John 14 and verse 26 says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall, what? Teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I've said unto you. Now, I'm not a big advocate of just memorizing Scripture. I think it's good if you want to take time to do that, and I'm amazed at the people that can quote chapters and even books of the Bible. It's wonderful. Uh, but I believe this word right here says, whenever I have need of it, if I have read it and put it in, the Holy Spirit will pull it out and bring it back again. And so I claim that by faith and walk in that, that I have what I need when I need it. Now, we also find in John 15, verse 26, but when the Comforter is come, which by the way, he came on the day of Pentecost, that Acts that we just read. When the Comforter is come, which has happened on the day of Pentecost. We're living in the is come era, okay? He's already come. He's here. Whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me. Okay, so he's the Spirit of truth, and he testifies of Jesus. Very important. Uh, John 16, verse 14, out of the book, it says here, He shall glorify me, Jesus talking, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. Rhema. Rhema. Glory to God. Are you with me? Back in 1 Corinthians 2nd chapter. Let's go back there. 1 Corinthians 2nd chapter. I want to point something out to you here. 1 Corinthians 2nd chapter, beginning with verse uh, 9. But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, the deep things of God. What man knows the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. You get what I'm saying here? Without the Holy Spirit baptism, then you're not going to understand this Bible. You're not going to see the fullness of Jesus. You're going to have a wrong Jesus in some places. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, not our wisdom, saints, but which Holy Ghost teaches, an out-of-this-world wisdom 
comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man refuses these things, receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for their foolishness to him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Now I want to show you back in Isaiah 28 where we were talking about the cornerstone. Before it gets to the cornerstone, look in Isaiah 28. I told you to mark it. And beginning with verse uh, 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge? Could be that you might be finding some verses you could use for your uh, lesson, homework lesson. Um, whom shall he teach knowledge? Whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. Mature Christians. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. What? In other words, tongues. Now Paul quotes that in 1 Corinthians 14th chapter uh, as he talks about tongues. And what he's saying here is that uh, the ones who speak in tongues will be the ones that he gets to teach and understand doctrine. Okay? This is vital because people who are teaching the Bible without the benefit of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, number one, have disobeyed God, and number two, are confusing doctrinal issues because they're teaching from their mind instead of the Spirit. And they may be very smart people and be able to figure out a certain extent of it, but you can't figure out the spiritual when you don't have the Spirit. Hello? Now the example of that is found here in, the, in this book. No offense to our teacher, whoever wrote the book. But it just shows you. He said here, 1 Corinthians 12, verses 7 and 8. He lists as the instance here of this uh, printed word, uh, the things of Christ through the printed word. And what that is in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 7 and 8, is the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge. It's a very supernatural uh, event that is brought about by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And it's called, we call it, the gifts of the Spirit. But he is misunderstanding here in thinking that it's natural wisdom shown to you. Natural knowledge is the context he's put it in. And so I brought this out to show you that although they can do a lot of work and compilation of scriptures and data from natural man's ability, because natural man can send a man to the moon. He's pretty doggone smart, okay? But he ain't smarter than God. So it takes God by the Spirit in us, when we just read, to reveal to us these things of the Spirit so that we know what's freely given to us. We know what's ours. Praise the Lord. So I, we, we have here the instances of the written word and the living word. The written word describes Jesus. The fulfillment of it in the word is the living word. Okay, where you can see Jesus fulfilling it is the living word. Okay? Why would we need to... Uh, why would we need to know this? Because it shows us truth. It shows us the infallibleness of the minute detail of the fulfillment of God's word. Okay? And that knowledge will boost your faith. It can't help but increase and establish and strengthen your faith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I've got, to, if, I've, I've got to take a few minutes here. Glory to God. John chapter 5. Look with me there if you would. John. I'm going to try to finish up with this. Um, we didn't get it all done, but I want to get this much in anyway. John chapter 5. Praise the Lord. John the 5th chapter. In John the 5th chapter and... Uh, 
verse 36. But I have greater witness than that of John. He was saying that John, you believe John, and he was a man. He says, but I have greater witness than that of John for the works, say works, which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. Okay? Now, verse 39, same thing, says, Search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. That's powerful words. The Scriptures are the ones who testify of Jesus. Okay? Now, he says here, uh, John, you, you believe, it was good, but he says, I've got a greater witness than that of John. Now listen, I've got a greater witness than that of John. What is the greater witness? Well, it was the Old Testament, the prophetic utterances, Genesis to Malachi, prophesying this man, God, man, Jesus, speaking here. He says, I have greater witness than John. I've got multitudes of prophets that have foretold, here I am. Hallelujah. Are you with me? And he called it here, note, the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me. Note the word works. We're going to go deeper into this. Look in John 10. John 10. And I'm going to try to finish as quick as I can. I'm showing about that time. Glory. <laughs> Hallelujah. Y'all can bear with me a few more minutes. This is class night. John 10, uh, verse 34. I'm going to read this because it's going to tie in a minute. Stay with me. I'm talking about the written word and the living word. I'm talking about the correlation and the importance of it. Okay? Okay. I want to show you, before you leave here tonight, why you need to be able to pick it out and understand it. Okay? Jesus answered them, verse 34, Is it not written in your law, the Old Testament? I said, you are gods. Interesting. If he called them gods, unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken... Say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God. Okay? Jesus said, they were fussing, saying he was blaspheming, for saying, calling God his Father, the Son of God. So he's clarifying here, all right? Verse 37. If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. The works of my Father. Okay, we said works. That's an important word. Hold your finger there. Put your hand there. Look in Genesis, the first chapter. Okay? i got to establish this here. Genesis 1-3. I'm going quick. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Verse 6. And God said, let there be firmament in the midst of the waters. Verse 9, and God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together. Verse 11, and God said, let the earth bring forth grass. Verse 14, and God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide day and night. Verse 20, and God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature. Verse 24, and God said, let the earth bring forth living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing. Verse 26, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Get this now. After our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle and over all the earth. This is important scripture, mark it. And over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. God said that, okay? Verse 29, and God said, behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed. Now, chapter 2, verse 1, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended what? 
His work. Remember I said the word work is to be remembered. God just called and God said all those things, his work. And when it came to man, he said, man, you're to have the dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, over every creeping thing, over everything. And man was supposed to fulfill that work. Now, he said here, verse 2, on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and rested on the seventh day. Go back to John. Please turn back to John, chapter 10, verse 37. If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. That is, if I don't fulfill the scriptures, okay? And God said, have dominion. I believe Jesus had plenty of dominion. He stilled the, 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 the waters when they were uh, tornadoes or hurricanes. He raised dead people. He had dominion. Hallelujah. He says, if I don't do the works of my Father, believe me not. Scripture uh, unfulfilled. If I'm not fulfilling what God said, if you don't see me in the Bible, don't have to believe. Verse 38. But if I do... Though ye believe not me, believe the works that you may know and believe. In other words, the scripture fulfilled. Look at the evidence. Look at the fact that the number of prophets that prophesied, and there he is fulfilling them. Look at the fulfillment. Look at the dominion that Jesus walked in. The Adamic dominion that Adam was supposed to have but gave to Satan, Jesus came and walked in it. All right? So we're seeing the works of God manifest. One more scripture, uh, John 14. John 14, just to finish this up, this is going to light your fire, I'm telling you. Hallelujah. Even if your wood's wet, I'm telling you, this is going to light your fire. Glory to God. John um, chapter 14, beginning with verse 10. Believest thou not that I am in the Father? We're talking about the Word made flesh. Believest thou not that I am in the Father? And God said, and the Father in me, the words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. In other words, I'm not even saying it. It's Father in me saying it but the father that dwelleth in me look at this he doeth the works what are the works and god said what kind of works did jesus do he said be healed and they were healed he said rise from the dead and they rose lazarus come forth and he came he said peace be still and it was stilled hallelujah do you hear what i'm saying tonight he says here that believe me, verse 11, that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Now, listen close. It is true that we are to believe because of the fulfillment of the Bible in Jesus. But you've got to take it a little step further. You've got to take it in context here. Verse 12 goes on to clarify. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works, and God said, the dominion that I do, shall he do also. Ye are gods, written in the word, scriptures cannot lie. Okay? And greater works than these, works, 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 because I go unto the Father. And whatsoever you'll ask in my name, that will I do, that Father may be glorified in the Son. If you'll ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now let me clarify verse 11. Okay, look back up there. He says, or else, he says, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else, that's number one, just believe. Or else, Believe me for the very work's sake. Okay, now we've always thought that to mean just the fulfillment of the scriptures in Jesus. Because he did do the works of the Father. He fulfilled them. But the context of it is that if you will believe him, then you will also do the works and greater works. So look at this this way. He says, believe me 
for the very work's sake. Listen to what I'm saying now. Believe me not to see that I have fulfilled the scripture. We know he has. We've established that. But believe me for the greater works. Listen to what I'm saying. Believe me for the greater works. The works that you're supposed to be doing as the church, the body of Christ on planet earth today. Do you hear what I'm saying? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I guess you can't tell this makes me look excited. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm saying to you that Jesus is saying the works were and God said, that's what we're to do, believe and speak. Say to the mountain, be thou removed, and don't doubt in your heart, the mountain will remove. That's a work of God. You can't do it on your own. It's supernatural. God has to do it. Do you hear what I'm saying? Jesus exemplified that. Now, we too, he says, believe me. In other words, reach out to me. Trust in me. Believe me. Take me for what I'm saying for the very work's sake. The sake of doing the gospel to win the lost souls. What do we read in Acts 1 and 8? You shall receive power to what? Be a witness. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. That's why we have to know the written word and the fulfillment in the living word so that we know the work of God in Jesus was complete and now it's passed to us to do the same. Mm, glory to God. Hallelujah. We'll finish the rest next week. Father, we love you. We thank you for this time together. We appreciate so much rhema, revelation knowledge, Lord. And we thank you, Father, for just burning this deep in our hearts, Lord. To believe you for the very work's sake, Lord. That we'll work these greater works in this final hour. As a miracle manifestation of your arms and legs on planet earth in this hour. In this final moment before the curtain falls. And we thank you for it, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Sorry I went you over. Glory to God.